Hey guys, and welcome to the Working Money Channel. So Bitcoin's still holding just under $43,000 at this moment in time. Um, today is Sunday, January the 16th, and Bitcoin has just been hovering in and around this area of support that we saw back in September for uh, quite a few days now, since about January 7th, January 8th. We haven't seen it move too much from here. We're hoping we're gonna see that retrace though, right? I mean, that retrace is um, going to be, or going to mean one of two things. It could be, well, one, it could be a retrace up to the 702 uh, at that point, we should see altcoins rally, and this is one theory. At this point in time, we would see resistance here, then Bitcoin forming a lower low. Hopefully you guys all have your plans to take your gains from your altcoin positions. That is one theory. The second theory is that uh, this isn't going to be the area that Bitcoin retraces to. It will pierce the point 702, continuing its momentum upwards to who knows how high, um, and that will be the next leg up for Bitcoin. Uh, in this scenario, it would take altcoins up with it, similar to what we saw back in here, right back in the spring, when we saw Bitcoin rally, we saw all the altcoins rally, and then everything correct throughout the summer, uh, and then we saw that new all-time high. Now, I mean, these are two separate theories, and I think there is definitely merit to both of them. I've been moving towards this second theory. I mean, I've got to say, uh, before I was leaning towards the first theory that Bitcoin has seen its all-time high, but there is a lot to suggest that we aren't there yet. And you know, the big point here that I ignored right at the beginning was this low volume, this low volume that I keep bringing up now. In previous bull runs, we always, 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 through the mania, through the FOMO, through the excitement, we always saw very, very high volume at the top. And now we are just not seeing that. So that on top of many other different indicators from uh, tech dev, other cryptocurrency analysts in the space, there are many reasons to suggest that this could just be another little blip before Bitcoin rallies. And uh, that would ultimately bring up other altcoins. Guys, I got XRP here on the daily as well. And uh, XRP also not moving too much um, from that point back on January 6th, January 7th, still just kind of hugging this level in here. Ultimately though, zooming out on XRP, we are still making higher lows. So that is positive news. We are now just waiting patiently for our exit targets. And uh, you guys can see here right now, XRP, as I said, 77 cents, just kind of touching the tip of this wick that we saw back in September, 2018, uh, just kind of grazing it here in November, 2020. And again, on February 1st, 2021. So finding that support in there, staying above that level of support. I think, uh, you know, most of us don't really want to see XRP go back down to 50 cents. Of course, the upward trajectory is what we are expecting for altcoins. Bringing up the total to market cap, you guys can see this is the entire market cap. Uh, excluding Bitcoin and uh, just throwing a traditional Fibonacci on there. Right now, the total market cap is um, is bouncing off this Fib level here and looking to move to higher levels. So bouncing off the 2.618, looking to get up to the 3.618, and uh, finally, hopefully, we get up to the 4.236, completing the whole Fibonacci cycle. Guys, I gotta say, you know, many of the other altcoins that are going to solve problems, these ones, I think, are going to have a very bright future, and, uh, you know, we should be paying attention to those coins. Uh, in this particular example, Algorand, we have this article from Michael at Val5 Links, Skybridge Capital founder Anthony Scaramucci says that Algorand will challenge leading competitors in the crypto industry, just as Google did in the early days of the internet. We know Algorand, one of the WEF coins, and guys, uh, over this next year, I think I'm going to be, um, you know, paying more attention to some of these WEF coins to see how they perform, uh, you know, just based on the fact that these are problem-solving coins, these are going to be the hand handful of coins, I think, that will not disappear necessarily. Skybridge Capital founder Anthony Scaramucci says that Algorand will challenge leading competitors in the crypto industry, just as Google did in the early days of the internet. And so uh, he recently just put out an interview. He says, I've got a quarter billion dollars in Algorand right now. I think Algorand will be the Google. You and I, when we were youngsters, we were logging into the internet using Alta Vista, uh, Lycos America Online, uh, so on and so forth. Then in 1998, this company came along called Google and people were like, why would I ever need to use that? I've got all these other instruments to access the internet. And then people say, well, you know, it's faster. It has machine learning. The algorithms are more widespread. It's going to lead to better outcomes. And lo and behold, Google trumped everybody. And I think that's what's going to happen with Algorand. So this is what he's saying. 
saying with regards to Algorand, Algorand is a proof of stake blockchain that enables developers to build decentralized applications or dApps for financial services. The smart contract platform is an Ethereum challenger that aims to accelerate transaction speed at lower cost. So for those of you guys uh, still kind of new to Algorand, there's a lot of information out there. Also a lot of excitement surrounding that token. Also a lot of deep pockets, a lot of um, very wealthy investors are supporting the Algorand project and for good reason. Right now, if I'm just looking on the chart, Algorand trading at about $1.40. So, you know, nothing terribly exciting with regards to the spec market, at least not yet. Full disclosure, I am invested in Algorand, so uh, I thought I should mention that. Michael also brought this to our attention now. Bitcoin ban would be disastrous for Ripple, says David Schwartz. This has to do with a cocky tweet that was posted over there on Twitter. David Schwartz, Ripple's chief technology officer, said that the US government banning Bitcoin would be disastrous for Ripple in a recent tweet. The same applies to the Ethereum cryptocurrency potentially being classified as an unregistered security. And so I'm gonna get to the tweets in a second, but just to give you guys a bit of the lowdown here, Schwartz's tweet came in response to a thread posted by Castle Island Ventures' Nick Carter, in which he accuses the San Francisco headquartered blockchain company of actively trying to undermine the two largest cryptocurrencies. Ripple CEO Brad Garlinghouse has a history of inaccurately portraying Bitcoin's energy use. Last April, he stated that XRP was 100,000 times more efficient than the largest cryptocurrency. After facing pushback from the community, the Ripple boss clarified that he was not advocating for banning Bitcoin. Uh, and so the article goes on, but I think we should actually take a look at the tweet here, David Schwartz saying, this is comically absurd. Either of those two things would be disastrous for Ripple. Nick Carter writing, if you're in any way affiliated with Ripple, you've ever worked with them or taken money from them, you're dead to me. It's that simple. Their entire strategy is to A, lobby government to get Bitcoin proof of work banned and B, to get Ethereum branded a security. So this is what uh, Nick Carter is saying here on Twitter. Of course, there were some other tweets that he mentioned and he was uh, trying to implicate somebody at the uh, Ripple University's blockchain research initiative. I think that Green Eggs and Sam pretty much sums it up here. John Deaton posting this, please remind me to never piss off Sam or at least never say dumbass crap. Epic takedown with a full stop followed by a mic drop. Guys, I gotta play you this. Bitcoin maximalist Nick Carter has found the smoking gun against Ripple, he tweets. We're at the point where the government is teaming up with Ripple to create paid opposition research on Bitcoin mining. And he points to this report from May of last year that lists Adair Morse as one of the authors of the study talking about high electricity use spills over into the local economy. And here it's in the financial support. It's disclosed that they get money from Ripple's UBRI and see there she is listed at the Department of Treasury which sounds pretty damning until you actually do one ounce of research and you see that Berkeley Haas blockchain initiative is a five-year partnership with Ripple, one that Professor Adair left months before the report was published to go work in the Biden administration's treasury department. She took leave and quit. So this is the same Biden administration that is currently suing Ripple to shut them down and give Bitcoin and Ethereum the advantage. So great theory there, Nick, but he doubles down on stupid and says, oh, and here's the punchline. People are dying because of $6 per month power costs, increase in power costs. That's what the paper finds, right? Well, you know what, Nick, $71 a year, may not be much to a yuppie venture capital asshole like you, but to people living under the poverty line, it is meaningful. And to sit there and suggest that these people should subsidize the externalities of the Bitcoin network so that you can rent seek on layer two on top of an inefficient layer one blockchain that's based on old technology shows what a complete pompous asshole you are. Look at what happened in Kazakhstan. China kicked the miners out. Some of them moved to Kazakhstan. That drove electricity prices up. And then when the government shut off the internet, the Bitcoin hash rate dropped over 10% and the country descended into chaos. Okay. There are real world consequences to this, Nick, but you wouldn't know that because you don't even allow comments in your echo chamber. You are just a humanitarian of the year. <laughs> 
ripping Nick Carter a new one. I gotta say, I love Sam I Am to the lifeboats on Twitter. He's also at Ham Eggs and Sam here on Twitter. Very good follow. I believe he also does have a Patreon site, so I urge you guys, sign up for Sam's Patreon. He's a smart guy, got a lot of interesting information to share. Here, I'll even link his Patreon in the description of the video for you guys if you care to subscribe. Sam's a great guy, one of the originals. I'm gonna keep going because, you know, Nick Carter also catching flack from, uh, Nick Carter also catching flack from some Ripple employees, namely Matt Hamilton. The problem with this argument is that companies are using XRP as an intermediate for cross-border payments. As in right now, 25% of all volume on RippleNet, which itself is quite a significant volume, is carried by XRP. You can see here that it is a Nick Carter tweet, but uh, for whatever reason, Nick Carter has limited who can now see his tweets. Matt Hamilton saying, you know, not only that, how would you use stablecoins? Stable to what currency? The XRP ledger was the first blockchain to have stablecoins and feedback from financial institutions was they didn't want to use them due to counterparty risk. Hence, using XRP as a bridge asset. I mean, think it through. Which stablecoins would a financial institution in Thailand and a financial institution in Brazil use to transact? Digital bot? Digital real? Most Bitcoiners strangely seem to think that USDT would be the best. Why would either country want to be beholden to the U.S. dollar? Let's say they use bot in a stable coin. The Thai entity sends bot to Brazil. Then what? What can the Brazilian FI do with the bot? There is no local market for it. The only way to redeem to stable coin is to send it back to the Thai issuer and we're back to square one. And so he just gives some stats here with regards to Ripple's ODL project. It grew 25X in quarter three of 2021 versus quarter three of 2020. We're 25% of total dollar volume in uh, quarter three of 2021 and now available in over 20 countries. And just to that point here, I also saw this from Bondcrypt XRP um, with regards to these stable coins. Now, Tether, there's been a lot of drama around Tether, not yet officially classified classified by uh, the U.S. government. And so now USDC has taken over Tether's limited U.S. dollar Tether or USDT, the largest stablecoin in the Web3 segment, has been dethroned by its major competitor on Ethereum. The flipping has been confirmed, guys. There are more USDC now on Ethereum than USDT. As per the tweet shared by Alex Spanevic, uh, CEO and founder of leading on-chain analytics team Nansen, the uh, Ethereum-based version of Circle's USDC coin surpassed US dollar tether on Ethereum in market capitalization. And so uh, you guys can see that chart here. Just gonna bring up that tweet real quickly. Bringing up this chart, you guys can see down in and around here, USDC has now officially surpassed USDT. So USDC, one of the ones where we have seen some type of legal framework surrounding it. USDT, however, mired in controversy. Of course, um, there has been lots going on surrounding that. I'll link a video uh, with regards to Tether that I did earlier last year. I'll link it up here in the top right-hand corner if you guys are not familiar. So very interesting points here. Of course, Nick Carter getting it from both sides. Sam I am. And Matt Hamilton, uh, you know, bringing up the facts. I mean, I don't even know what he tweeted. I don't know if he was uh, responding to this same tweet here. But um, I think that dispels a lot of the FUD. Uh, I want to keep moving, guys, because I know the SEC lawsuit, there was a verdict recently from Judge Netburn. And so, you know, there was this one school of thought that suggested Judge Netburn's verdict of Hinman's speech, saying that uh, it was his personal opinion only, that this could actually help prove Ripple's fair notice defense. Well... There's another side to this, and uh, I thought it was only fair to mention this to you guys. Of course, you know, I'm not biased. I want to keep the lines of communication open, and I always love to hear both sides. So Stefan Hubert bringing this up in a tweet thread, Securities Trial versus Settlement, a thread about why the XRP community is so divided over the DPP decision. Thanks to uh, Crypto Eddie here, the scales just fell from my eyes. So Crypto Eddie recently did a video on this. I suggest you guys check out her YouTube channel uh, if you're not already subscribed or whatever. She just did a video on this. This, but Stefan Hubert saying, I now understand why many of you are so disappointed with the judge's decision on DPP and why others were so happy about it. Some of you think Ripple can win the trial. Others, and that includes me, are hoping for a settlement as soon as possible. Crypto Eri talked about how she had previously believed the SEC didn't want a settlement, but then explained why she believes Ripple was the party which didn't want to settle until now because their position is so strong. She centered her YouTube video yesterday on a conversation of former SEC lawyers talking about how embarrassing it was for the SEC when they lost an easy to win crypto fraud case because of fair notice. So the SEC has already been through this a few times before. And uh, you know, Ripple is the big fish. 
they cannot mess this up because this could have long lasting implications with regards to cryptocurrency clarity moving forward. Of course, there's also that, uh, you know, that sub story of the turf war between the SEC and the CFTC. Who is going to get to regulate cryptocurrencies? Could there be a separate body altogether? I mean, these are all offshoot kind of topics that have to do with the same thing. Chris Giancarlo talked about this and I did a video about that a few weeks ago. I'll link that video up here in the top right hand corner. But back to this for a second. Stefan Hubert continues. He says, however, Ripple only has a strong case for a declaration of value if Hinman's speech is an official SEC position. This would have allowed Ripple to invoke Ethereum and win the trial hands down. So that would be a huge win for Ripple. Now, however, since Hinman's speech was only his personal opinion, the case for Ripple is very unclear and uncertain. So whereas, you know, that position taken of um, because of this classification of the Hinman speech, that would make Ripple's fair notice defense clear, Stefan Hubert has another opinion. Not only would the judge have to make the first and landmark decision on crypto and securities, no, the SEC could also appeal this ruling and drag it all the way to the Supreme Court. But that would certainly go far for Ripple's shareholders and new legislation would probably have to come along in the meantime. After the DPP decision, the variant that the court decides on, the security status has become much more uncertain and the incentive for Ripple to settle is much greater. So instead of actually, uh, you know, taking it to the end, the confidence that uh, Brad Garlinghouse and Chris Larson had at the beginning, this actually puts into question, at least according to Stefan, puts into question some of the other arguments that we've heard from the Ripple camp in this case, which would give them more incentive to settle sooner. Since Ripple has not been given access to the internal documents on how the SEC defines a security, but only to the documents on Ethereum and Hinman's speech, the pressure for Ripple to aim for a safe and fast settlement has increased significantly. So I guess the question is now will Ripple settle? Clarity on whether XRP is not a security or not after studying the Tetragon ruling will not possibly take place through the SEC itself, but either through the Treasury Department or through new legislation. A ruling one way or the other would be far too risky and uncertain for Ripple in either direction. So where do we stand now? Mumble and uh, here on Twitter saying the main problem I'm having here is that for the first time I am under a very strong impression that Judge Netburn's decision is biased. The idea that this speech can be viewed as his personal opinion is an offense to all those who believe in fair U.S. justice. How come? You know, we've heard this from other members of the XRP community. There are so many times in William Hinman's speech where he uses the word we, for example, suggesting we at the SEC, the body that he works for, considering he is talking about a cryptocurrency, this should not be deemed a personal opinion, but, you know, an opinion that has to do with work-related subjects. That's how I see it. LaRue Kiki here says SEC and Hinman both testified in the case that the speech was his opinion. Based on their testimony, the judge says the emails are therefore not protected under DPP. Don't know what's in those emails, but pretty sure the SEC doesn't want Ripple to see them. So... Uh, Codename Crypto saying, I kind of thought the opposite. However, maybe I'm wrong. Back when Hinman gave his speech, tons of news outlets reported on it. Uh, so it's very clear everyone thought that speech was the SEC's position. If all these successful organizations were confused, how was Ripple to know? And so that just goes again to the fair notice defense. Ripple's fair notice defense is now stronger than ever. The SEC can't afford to lose on this statement. Settlement incoming. The SEC will want to go after other projects. Ethereum will be the next now that they can say Hinman was rogue. Ethereum money will flow into XRP. This coming from XRPC here on Twitter. And so that's another point we have to consider. Guys, let's remember, even if there is a settlement, that is not necessarily a bad thing. Settlements usually mean that, okay, Ripple gives up something, the SEC gives up something, they come to an agreement, and both parties are not happy, but at least Ripple's free to do business, the SEC probably gets their payday, and they continue pursuing cryptocurrencies that have no regulatory clarity in their mind. So, you know, a settlement, not necessarily the worst thing, I, I don't think. XRP Joe down here saying, so let's not forget the judge saw all of the docs Ripple wanted in camera review. To me, if the judge saw things in the docs that are damning, she already knows everything in them, even the ones Ripple doesn't get. I wonder how that works for a judge. Anyone know? And so uh, Raul here asking uh, Jeremy Hogan and John Deaton if they can explain this. D2BMTM saying, I think Ripple will settle with the SEC at any time if the SEC is willing to give XRP today status as an unsecurity asset or a non-security asset. Will the SEC do that? I doubt it. 
The SEC is not losing anything at this point. They have unlimited amount of time and money, so they really don't care. XRP Soldier saying, case will be settled. Congress is working on legislation. When this is ready, they will settle. Ripple needs legislation to thrive in the US. Lawsuit is just a smokescreen. This lawsuit was necessary to get the ball rolling in Congress. Without the lawsuit, it would take another couple of years and Ripple does not have that amount of time because of the Great Reset for the World Economic Forum, the International Monetary Fund, etc. So many, many different points of view here and a lot of great opinions. This is one of the most uh, robust Twitter contribution threads I've seen uh, from the XRP community, I think in a long, long time. I think, you know, this topic is very passionate to a lot of us. So on the one hand, the fair notice defense could be stronger. On the other hand, could it weaken Ripple's case to force them to settle sooner? And, you know, even if they did have to settle, is that necessarily a bad thing? I wanted to thank all the contributors here in this tweet thread, especially Stefan Hubert, for bringing up this extremely poignant point of view here. As time goes by, there's more evidence coming out in this case all the time. There are going to be ups and downs, guys. Remember what Brad Garlinghouse said at the beginning. This from XRP underscore Crow here, again from December of 2020. Chris and I had the option to settle separately. We could do that and it would all be behind us. That's how confident Chris and I are that we are right. We will aggressively fight and prove our case. Now, I don't know if Brad's opinion has changed since then. A lot more is coming out in the wash. I don't necessarily think a settlement is the worst outcome, but that's just my opinion. I wanna hear what you guys think. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Like the video if you like the content I'm providing. I always love hearing your comments. See you in the next one, guys.